Okay, I think we're good. <clears throat> Hello, all. Welcome uh, to the China and the World Programs event for today. Uh, everyone in the room is having their lunch, so if uh, if you don't hear um, anyone on online, that's that's why. Uh, my name is Daniel Sahansky. I'm the de deputy director of the China and the World Program. I'm stepping in for Tom, who is on sabbatical this year. Um, he will only be intermittently um, sort of on and off campus and, and around for our events. Today, we have a very special um, presentation by one of our former fellows, Isaac Cardone. Um, he and his uh, co-author, I guess she's the, the primary author, uh, Sheena uh, Chestnut Grittens is online. She's not in person, so you'll hear a voice over, but it, it'll all work out. It'll be fantastic. Um, Sheena is an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. She is on leave herself uh, from 2023 to 2024 and serves as a visiting associate professor of research in the Indo-Pacific Security at the U.S. Uh, Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute. Dr. Chestnut Gretton's uh, research focuses on security, authoritarian politics, and foreign policy in East Asia. At UT, she directs the Asia Policy Program, a joint initiative of the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and the Clement Center for National Security. She is also a Keen Kirkpatrick Visiting Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Her first book, Dictators and Their Secret Police, came out in Cambridge in 2016, uh, examined variations in international security and repression in Taiwan, South Korea, and the Philippines during the Cold War, and won multiple book awards. Isaac Cardone is a senior fellow for China Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He is concurrently adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins SAIS and was formerly assistant professor at the U.S. Naval War College, where he served as a research faculty member in the China Maritime Studies Institute. Isaac's research centers on the People's Republic of China, maritime power with specialization in maritime disputes, and the international law of the seas. PRC, Global Port Development, PLA, Overseas Basing, and Chinese-Pakistan Relations. His writing appears in International Security, Security Studies, Foreign Affairs, the Naval War College Review, as well as otherly scholarly uh, and policy publications. Isaac's book, uh, China's Law of the Sea, the New Rules of Maritime Law, which came out through Yale in 2023, analyzes whether and how China is making the rules of regional and global war. Warm welcome to Isaac and Sheena. I should update that Sheena is actually now non-resident at the Carnegie Endowment for International oh. Peace rather than the AI as of, as of this year. So, uh, so sorry for that, Sheena. No problem. And oh. uh, just to clarify, we did the authors in alphabetical order, but this is very much an equal collaboration. Thanks. So happy to have uh, Isaac take the lead on presenting today and I'll, I'll jump in as appropriate. But for those who are listening, it can be awkward to have a remote person try to, to be too uh, central to the conversation. So um, Isaac is on point and I'll jump in in the discussion as as relevant. But um, but thanks for the clarification. And, and Isaac, over to you. Thanks, Sheena, and thank you, uh, Daniel. Thanks to CWP, my my uh, longtime intellectual home, and to the Weatherhead Institute and Professor Nathan for hosting uh, me and Sheena to present a paper that's very much a work in progress. And what we're hoping to do here is uh, certainly inform on an issue that we think is of relevance to all of you, but really also to solicit your your critical thoughts and feedback and questions. And I'll try and highlight a couple of the areas where we feel like we we need to think through what evidence we're going to be able to get. We need to think through how we can theoretically get a handle on what we're describing as a, uh, a tension or maybe even a typology of different types of international security, regional security versus regime security, as we've flagged inelegantly in the title, is, is describing what we're trying to understand here. It's trying to put our finger on some of the new patterns of security co cooperation under US-China competition. And by way of framing, it, it has been the case for a long time that the conventional wisdom tells us that countries don't want to choose between the United States and China as a security partner or as a partner in general. Um, why choose if the United States provides security and China provides economic prosperity? That has been the basic balance, particularly in China's region for some period of time. But uh, many in this room will know that China's security interests, its overseas interests, as they describe them, and its policies and activities in support of those have really 
changed pretty dramatically over the last uh, decade or more. Um, this dynamic of a new great power security player generates an important subset of cases that we're really trying to dial in on here. And I'll show you how those uh, kind of fit into our matrix in a moment. But basically, we're looking at countries that have security relationships, substantial security relationships with both the United States and China as an opportunity at, analytically to try and understand this trade-off. And as an initial observation, we observe there are countries that have quite significant security relationships with both the US and China. And this is a little bit difficult to compute, especially when China is the primary regional security threat for some of these players uh, and vice versa. America may be conceived as the primary regime security threat to some of these players. There's an interesting dynamic. And I, I will say up front, I don't think that we've quite figured it out yet, uh, but we're hopeful that this typology and this way of analyzing U.S. and Chinese security goods, as we're calling them, and differentiating them uh, is useful. So maybe you can click a click through a slide. Great. Um, so um, as I mentioned, the framing has to do with this kind of broad question on why some states choose both China and the U.S. as security partner. And one of the things that we're really trying hard, one of the, the fallacies that we're trying hard to avoid is this notion of mirror imaging. Uh, as someone who's looked a lot at Chinese security and military activities overseas, outside of their immediate region, I can tell you that it is often quite misleading to, to imply or infer that somehow the Chinese military and security presence is likely to be providing the same types of security as does the United States in its many alliance and partnership security partnership relationships. Um, so we think what, what each country can offer its potential security partners actually reflects some very fundamental differences in American and Chinese national security outlooks. We argue that the U.S. primarily offers its partners regional security, by which we mean improving partners' capability to deter and deny external threats to their territory. And again, these, this phenomenon we think is particularly pronounced in relationships uh, that are within America's network of allies and mutual defense treaties and all the many close security relationships organized around common threats in regions of interest. By contrast, China's security goods are geared towards regime security. Um, that is augmenting incumbent leaders' capability to prevent and control uh, internal threats to their power rather than building up alliance type relationships emphasizing traditional military affairs china establishes security relationships that prioritize stability and control in domestic affairs so the 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 proto theory that we've tried to sketch out in this 2 by tier, 2 by 2 helps us identify what we could think of as the dependent variable of interest these cases in which you have countries that are actively pursuing substantive security relations with the United States. And our kind of added twist on it is this conceptualization, this typology of regime versus regional. And we're, we are very keen for your feedback on whether or not that is useful, whether or not that computes with your understanding of, of the case. In order to, to flesh this out, we have selected two case studies, again, from that quadrant of interest, I'm sort of selecting on the dependent variable technique for those who are sensitive to that, but it's precisely because this is the type of case that is an outlier or deviant case for kind of conventional prevailing theory that you would balance against your primary threat and that there's some type of direct competition or some, some uh, mutual exclusivity between relation security relationships with rival great powers. Uh, and we think that these cases of Vietnam and the United Arab Emirates are not the only ones. We listed a couple that we think of as relevant there in that top left quadrant. But there are ones that offer a, an interesting site for developing our theory, developing some insights. So uh, we go into some detail on them in a draft paper that anybody who really wants to, to, to get in the weeds on is welcome to take a look at and give us some feedback. But I'll try and sketch what we see in those case studies, sketch why they help us conceptualize this idea of regime and regional security. Uh, and then at the end, we'll try and synthesize that a little bit and think about these interactive effects and their implications. Um, so let's move along. 
Hmm. Maybe I can click through that or not. Um, what do we got here? I want to make sure I know what's coming next. So I don't. Sure. Here we go. So just by way of uh, uh, visualizing what we're saying, we're using regime and regional security, of course, as ideal types. I don't think that it's it is a there is appropriate to think of this as a as a totally differentiated set of security goods on offer. In fact, probably the bulk of them are recognizable as some of the same things. Both militaries and sort of defense and security apparatus in Washington and Beijing engage with their security partners in this middle ground that we've showed here uh, that includes traditional mill to mill relations, military to military, arms, sales, exercises, et cetera. Uh, and also prominently a variety of non-traditional security activities. And these are where we see the most overlap. It's the area of the most activity from Chinese armed forces. These are things like counter piracy, which was their first extended overseas deployment, uh, counter terrorism, counter narcotics, cybersecurity, a range of non-traditional security threats, and especially police and law enforcement. That starts to shade over into the, to the category that we're most interested in that we've highlighted in, in black, uh, with white text there, is understanding some of the differentiated or really distinctive elements of what China does. Uh, and basically, one of the things that we want to understand is what what the relationship is when these, when these Venn diagrams intersect in the same country, because we view that as a site to actually observe what, what differentiates what the United States can do for you as a third country and what the Chinese can do for you as a third country. So ultimately, that's the analytical lens we're trying to get at. You could think of it as the demand side for security. Uh, we're also working on a piece on the supply side, which will be trying to understand, for example, the, the Global Security Initiative, which is one of many banner initiatives that are geared towards extending China's activities and relationships and security affairs overseas. Um, so let me not dwell on this too long other than to off offer you that th this is an ideal type version of uh, of a relationship, and again, uh, not intended to describe so much the, the uh, observed empirics of all security interactions, but rather what distinguishes them, what differentiates them. So thinking about U.S. security cooperation with Vietnam, which was really the case that inspired, uh, one of the main cases that inspired China and me to start thinking and talking about this was that starting uh in the in the in about 2016 and accelerating until then the United States and Vietnam have been pursuing a very uh a very new and quite uh radically different set of military to military and conventional defense relationships obviously these are former wartime enemies uh who had had long standing hostility that has gradually dissipated to the point where from a demand side, Vietnam has been quite solicitous of American security and particular conventional defense interest in its regional security matters. And we see this quite explicitly and emphatically in both the Vietnamese and in the English official readouts, as well as in the way that they structure their dialogues. We look at the U.S. Department of Defense as basically being in the, the lead actor in this engagement, the the relationships kind of signal points have been uh, a visit of the USS John McCain. McCain, of course, being a, a former uh, POW in Vietnam, a very symbolic gesture and sign of mutual interest in changing the nature of the defense relationship. That's been followed by carrier visits. And finally, last year, uh, President Biden was out there with his, again, BOD and national security uh, staff to sign a comprehensive strategic partnership with Vietnam. Uh, that comprehensive strategic partnership is still being fleshed out. As I said, this was just September 2023. But what we understand about its objectives and about the types of defense articles and the types of cooperation and exercises that will be done is that it has to do with regional maritime security, fundamentally. There's a lot of discussion from both the US and the, the Vietnamese side about freedoms of navigation, for example. And while they 
basically scrupulously avoid in the bilateral conversation saying China is our maritime, regional maritime security problem, our regional security problem. It's quite explicit in the way that this relationship has been formed. That's the primary U.S. regional security goal. And it's Vietnam's primary regional security threat and always has been in some fundamental ways, with the exception of some episodes uh, in the 20th century. So what we can say from this case is that we see kind of the, a, a classic and maybe archetypal way of the United States engaging, but it's also quite new. And it comes in the context of a very longstanding regime security type relationship between Vietnam and China. Uh, now, what we see in the readouts and in particular in the personnel and the types of engagements that they are pursuing as part of their comprehensive strategic partnership, uh, an interesting parallelism, also you know, a, a diplomatic symbolic statement of an intent to cooperate more deeply and more comprehensively, a key term that I'll come to in a moment, uh, on security affairs. This interaction takes place in a very intimate way between the two communist parties who have had very long and complex set of relationships to include being wartime allies effectively against the United States, and then ultimately uh, fighting some significant uh, battles, both in the maritime domain as well as on their border over the course of the 70s and 80s, and all, only normalizing their relationship again in the 1990s. And a key pillar, and in fact, I would argue sort of the central piece of that security relationship has had to do with cooperation being strengthened between law enforcement and security departments, uh, Vietnam's Ministry of Public Security and their counterpart organization in China, as well as intelligence agencies, the, the MSS, Ministry of State Security uh, uh, Director Chen Yixin was in Vietnam before Vietnam's trip. Chen Wenqing, who's the head of the Zheng Fawei, the political and legal affairs department, former MSS chief, uh, also has been meeting with Vietnamese counterparts. And you see in the way that they mesh their personnel, what are the, what are the priorities? What are the things we're talking about? And just to give you a flavor of it, when Xi Jinping visited uh, in December of last year, he told his counterpart, not the president, but the general secretary of the Vietnamese Communist Party, that they intend to prioritize national political security. I'll talk a little bit about political security. It's a term of art. Ensure the red flag of socialism not be changed, a regime security story, and spare no effort to prevent, diffuse, and contain all kinds of political and security risks. Uh, the PAP, the, the People's Armed Police, again, sort of the, this pseudo law enforcement uh, agency is one of the one of the lead agencies in this bilateral relationship. And they propose bilateral collaboration to ensure social safety and order in each country. And the key functional pillars of that are anti-terrorism, anti-protest and anti-riot. Um, so, of course, as we said, we're, we, we have cherry picked these cases precisely because of the stark differences in the way they engage, and it's intended to, to hopefully develop some analytic insight. We see a slightly different, but ultimately, I think the sort of same phenomenon in the, and actually, let me, I'm not, I'm not telling you what all these pictures are, but that's a Chinese Coast Guard cutter there in the top left, symbolizing that that primary regional threat. We see Xi and his counterpart, uh, Nguyen Phu Trong, and then in the bottom left is the chief prosecutor in the Chinese system, and then a shot with Chen Wenqing, the, the Zheng Fawei, the political and legal affairs director, as well as some of those people from his, his Xi Tong. Uh, that's the lead Xi Tong. That's the lead organization in this bilateral relationship. And it differs quite significantly from the defense-led engagement that the United States has. And I'm trying to click through here. It seems to be stymied again. Um, so, let's try again. Oops, I think I went too. There we go. So the US UAE regional security relationship, this defense security relationship, by contrast to Vietnam, is actually quite longstanding. We see uh from the beginning of the first Gulf War, uh a very, very receptive United Arab Emirates on this conventional defense front. They were in the midst of watching Iraq uh invade. Kuwait, parts of Saudi Arabia, and feared their own territory and ended up granting a, a pretty wide array of basing and access 
uh, to the United States Armed Forces, ended up operating quite closely uh, with U.S. forces in all of the campaigns beginning in the first Gulf War in various ways. And these are some of the some of the kudos they've been given even quite recently from the U.S. State Department. Uh, it's has been focused both on regional external terrorist threats, as well as the UAE's primary sort of regional security problem, Iran. The idea of deterring Iran and its proxies is very central to the to the discussions that are going on between these militaries. And I've flagged kind of a leadership level uh, little uh, binocular session there, as well as a rank and file operators level interaction just to emphasize that these are joint these are forces that have operated jointly there's interoperability the UAE uses a very substantial amount of US military equipment about 64% by value of their uh their force structure is american or rather of their imports are american arms uh and as I'll talk about uh in the context of china but I guess we may as well start now over time the united arab emirates has sought to diversify its security partners and again i don't think this is a particularly uh, surprising phenomenon, but precisely the way in which they've done it, we think is quite interesting. Um, uh, China is one of those key partners with whom the UAE has sought to diversify. We've seen the United Arab Emirates kind of gra gradually uh, play with this bilateral dynamic of the United States and now China being quite interested in security affairs in their country. Uh, I flagged on the the Previous slide, uh, the picture was was of F-35 jets. That would be the biggest and most significant uh, aircraft sale to the UAE since selling uh, a very large uh, suite of F-16 EFs to them back around the turn of the century. They have an air force and a force structure overall that has some of the highest end American equipment. But that particular deal is a really interesting kind of vignette of this security competition because American officials kind of put a hold on it in the context of reports that the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, the Chinese military forces, had agreed or were in the process of developing a military base in Abu Dhabi, uh, in the capital of the United Arab Emirates, uh, just down the road from the U.S.'s main maritime uh, operational hub at Jebel Ali, and just next to the Al Dafra Air Base, <clears throat> Air Base where 5,000 U.S. troops are deployed and where U.S. assets like F-22s have operated, a very sensitive, high-end military and security partner that is now increasingly receptive to a variety of overtures from China, including on this conventional security front. Um, there we go. So that said, that I think is one of the key episodes that leads us to this fallacy of mirror imaging. What we see when we look at China-UAE cooperation Hues much more to this regime security storyline. I have there one of these uh, these uh, helicopter attack and surveillance drones that was recently announced as a big major sale from China to the UAE. And it's indicative of the types of capabilities that are of most interest to the UAE in this engagement. Um, there is a very explicit sort of diplomatic quid pro quo that is associated with this relationship as well. We're again primarily thinking about the demand side here, but putting the supply and demand side together, China, including its top leadership, Xi Jinping and Wang Yi, have been very, very explicit about the linkage between Xinjiang, a Muslim part of China that uh, whose population has been subjected to some pretty, uh, pretty extraordinary repression that has inflamed parts of the world, but notably not the Muslim world, uh, not the Gulf uh, Arab region, and in large part because of this very uh, concerted diplomatic and I believe sort of security quid pro quo that's associated with it. So China thanks the UAE for its valuable support on Xinjiang related issues and supports the UAE in pursuing its own comparable set of issues with domestic or internal uh, opposition. Uh, the focus of this cooperation is the the watchwords of it have been anti watchwords have been anti terrorism and radicalization, and uh, I've been trying to use anti terrorism rather than counter terrorism as another distinction with a with a difference because 
even though you could translate the word in, in the same way, what they're talking about and what they're actually practically cooperating on when they talk about counter or anti-terrorism is quite different than the U.S. counterterrorism campaign against, say, ISIS or Al-Qaeda uh, or any of the other groups in the region that they have, again, cooperated quite extensively with the UAE. What we see is the Emirates worried about the waves of domestic internal threat that have washed over the region, in particular since the Arab Spring in 2011. And so when we look at the leadership readouts between the UAE and PRC, we see, again, this differentiated personnel. Uh, here pictured, I think, is, let's see, Chen Guoping. I recognize him now, who's the head of what appears to be the lead diplomatic organ that is working this relationship. It's part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but it's the Department of Foreign Security Affairs. And they liaison with Ministry of Public Security, Ministry of State Security, and intelligence uh, elements of the PLA, according to their sort of description of what the department does. Um, you see, of course, the high-level leadership engagement on those, those kind of sensitive issues of Xinjiang. And for the Emirates, their sensitivity to domestic threat as a federated monarchy. It is clearly of a regime type that uh, should not be coded as, as democratic. And their ways of managing public opinion and public sentiment have been quite repressive and have employed a lot, look to employ a lot of the tools that China appears to use in its own domestic affairs. And so you sort of see this, this level of reciprocity in the relationship. But as I said, there is also this element, and this is not the case in Vietnam, and we're interested in kind of trying to get leverage on it, of an opening aperture for more significant military to military cooperation of what appears, at least on its face, to be the conventional variety. As I said, we have arms sales, but they are primarily drones, uh, unmanned and autonomous systems. There you have a wing long uh, surveillance drone that can also, I believe, have strike missions. Um, and that little inset of a newspaper that you'll not be able to read is a very detailed Chinese analysis of the UAE's new defense industrial policy, which, as I said, has been trending towards diversi diversification, trying to open up to European as well as Chinese suppliers and partnerships. Um, in, the on in the inset on the right, what we see is a very kind of familiar scene in a way of military to military diplomacy. That was a, the captain of a Chinese destroyer showing up at a port in at the port in Abu Dhabi to a, a throng of Chinese uh, citizens. There are some 400,000 Chinese citizens uh, uh, about in the UAE, by far the largest number in the region, which goes some way towards helping to understand what China's motivations are here. And you can't quite, you actually can probably make it out. The crane just near all those flags says Costco shipping. Uh, and that's because this is a Costco terminal at uh, at uh, Khalif. It's the Khalifa terminal in Abu Dhabi that Costco owns 90 percent of and that has been a hub for PLA Navy operations since it has stood up and is now adjacent to what uh, reporting in The Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post, uh, as well as some some corroborating evidence from around the region, has suggested is the site of an active PLA construction project and may well have been agreed to be some sort of base, perhaps a signals intelligence hub. Um, so what we see is the PRC's military diplomacy being very focused on its own citizens and there being a big diplomatic element of it. We have here them welcoming the uh, welcoming this uh, uh, destroyer to the to Abu Dhabi and a second port call not so long ago. And in the outs in the the bottom right there, what I've pictured is the Chinese alternative to the to the F-35. It's a J-35 fighter that when the UAE and PRC had their first ever joint air exercises in Xinjiang last year in August was sort of floated on the table as here's something that you could get, quite a symmetric type of competition with the United States. Um, and I think, you know, th this is by way of showing we don't think that this is such a neat cleavage between regime versus regional security. There's obviously a, a, uh, a conventional security element here, but I think it's in keeping with the overall argument that in the current condition, uh, 
in the current condition, I'll try and sort of wrap up here because I've gone longer than I wanted. Um, in the current condition, we see countries that have a diverse set of interests, and they're actually the ones whose demand is creating the conditions under which either American or security uh, assistance can come to roost. The UAE, pursuing its own interests, wants to diversify and make its defense industrial base independent. And I think China, for its own defense industrial base purposes, surely has some common cause there. But the thrust of the this relationship, as well as the Vietnam one, we think, as sort of initial exploratory cases, gives us some, some confidence that, empirically speaking, states do not have to choose. We feel pretty confident about that. And in fact, several key states are cooperating with both the U.S. and China on very sensitive national security affairs. Um, you could say these sorts of case studies should help us not just understand that China is more than an economic great power, but to start to be a little bit more specific about what type of a security power it is, what type of role it's likely to play, for example, in the Middle East or in its region with respect to these issues and in a non-symmetric style competition with the United States. Um, the Chinese focus on internal political security is something I want to just uh, leave a more of an open-ended thought on the table as we're wrapping up here, which is that I think if there is a if there's a mirror imaging phenomenon here, perhaps what we could say it is, is that each great power mirror images their threat perceptions and their security interests into their partners. This shouldn't come as any particular surprise, especially when you have large power differentials, that the great power is probably going to be determinative of what sorts of goods they're putting on offer. Again, that supply side. But thinking about them interactively, um, what we see is the United States wanting to keep regional threats at arm's length to include, or rather prominently to, to focus on keeping those threats in distant regions and keeping the that regional threat uh, posture forward deployed, interoperable and, and with access to foreign host nations and militaries. Uh, by contrast, we see, and, and this is uh, where I hope Sheena will, will weigh in afterwards and really explicate this with some more, some more depth and sophistication, but ultimately China's primary security focus is domestic. Regime security is the core of political security. Political security is the core of national security. China's uh, uh, paramount leader, Xi Jinping, is the author of the comprehensive or holistic national security concept as of 2013. And we see this sort of washing through the entire practice of Chinese security. And in fact, the practice in many other areas of policy where there didn't used to be security considerations. And so we see evidence of this in the way that China engages with its foreign counterparts. And it is quite parallel, but not symmetric, I think, with the way that the United States is operating. A last kind of open-ended thought on the this interactive dynamic is that these are not, these are obviously not independent activities. The demand for US security and Chinese security. I think is interacting in quite an interesting way in these third countries. And that's why we wanted, why we think case studies is an appropriate way to get at this and to start to develop some intuitions. But take either Vietnam or the UAE and consider what is the source of their regime security concerns. Um, it has to do with their form of government and the nature of their legitimacy in that system. And for each of these regimes, and I would argue for many, if not all authoritarian regimes around the world, the vector of threat has the United States squarely in the middle of it that they perceive from domestic unrest. The Arab Spring, whether rightly or wrongly, attributed American technology, American ideology, presence of American power in the region. For Vietnam, the United States, the reason that it's been so long in coming to develop this defense relationship is that the United States continues to have very strong human rights and other sort of uh, effectively ideological concerns about the nature of their governance, the nature of how they treat their own people uh, and the legitimacy of their rule. If we're not thinking seriously about what the national security threats are that are facing these third countries, you'll have a hard time computing what I, we think is actually not such a surprising finding, but rather one that kind of confounds the normal way of thinking about international security. Um, and 
I will, I'll leave it on the point that China's work on this is really seminal. Her thinking about China's grand strategy uh, really informs this, this whole project and this idea that it is internal security that motivates and, in fact, informs the way that China perceives its external and international security threats. The idea of a clean, neat, internal, external uh, analytic distinction is probably quite inappropriate. It certainly doesn't comport with the way that Xi Jinping and the national security apparatus in China discuss security now as holistic or comprehensive. Um, and I guess a, a final thought on an implication is that, you know, for all the hand waving about, you know, this, you know, the mirror image of the U.S. coming into being in, in China, having the same type of regional security ambitions, casting that aside, there are still some threats and problems that are associated with this. And one is certainly that as the United States has used its defense and security cooperation and provision as a source of leverage, something to offer and withdraw, China is putting itself in a position to do that and a position to be a much more effective international security bargainer without sort of matching the U.S. carrier for carrier or base for base or destroyer for destroyer, although they may well do the latter. So let me... Uh, Wrap it up there. I'm sure I left a lot on the table there that Sheena wishes I'd gotten to, but we'll get a chance to hear from her in the Q and A. So thank you. Absolutely. Sheena, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good. Do you want to say anything uh, in regards to the, the presentation before we go to the Q and A? No, I think um, I think Isaac did a, a great job of outlining the phenomenon that we're trying to explain, which is, um, you know, why it is that we see countries increasingly seeking security cooperation with both the United States and China when there is an intensifying strategic and security rivalry between the two. Um, that seemed sort of notable and counterintuitive to us and worthy of explanation. And the more that we looked, it just struck us that these were very complementary and non-substitutable um, forms of security cooperation, that the US and China are actually doing something quite different. Um, and so, you know, I, th I think that um, we're interested in sort of the audience's read on whether this explanation makes sense. How do we plug this into larger sort of theoretical constructs of what's going on in global politics right now? Um, and, you know, we recognize we spent a long time talking about case selection because this is very much we're looking at the outlier cases um, that don't fit the conventional narrative. Um, but then obviously we want to go back methodologically and check and make sure that we haven't created a, a causal problem for ourselves by selecting on the dependent variable in, in picking outlier cases. So appreciate thoughts on, on both research design and sort of how to fit this into broader theoretical frameworks. But um, but I think Isaac did a, a great Great job um, introducing it. And I'd, I'd really at this point be more curious what the audience's reaction is. I mean, we we can and sometimes do talk about this at great length, but I, I don't wanna um, just keep talking. I'd, I'd much rather hear what people's reactions and, and thoughts are in response. So thanks. All right, so so everyone can hear online. I'll make sure to hand them the microphone. Do you wanna field the questions and then you okay. can answer them? Sure. Um, and questions? All service. Uh, thanks so much for the very interesting um, talk and very interesting question, and also the uh, argument. Um, my, uh, I was just wondering, uh, you argue China as a re uh, regime security partner, but actually China is not better at providing regime security, but more willing to do it. Because I noticed all those regime security partners of China are just autocracies. So, and you also mentioned that since the, the U.S. is a liberal democracy, it's actually not quite willing to provide those repression uh, to, uh, to us for those autocracies. So then my question is, uh, how much is this, uh, the story that you just told, a story of the interaction between regime and the uh, regional security, or just the, is just the interaction between balance of power and the ideological alignment that discussed by um, uh, um, by Mark Haas, that because uh, if if we go go to your two by two table and we replace the re uh, regional security with balance of power and the regime security with ideological alignment, then it also makes sense. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll let Tina take the 
first cut at that. Thanks. Maybe hold on to that there if you yeah. really need some work. Thanks. Sure. I, I, um, I have a couple of thoughts and, and um, uh, I'm going to rely on the folks at the front table to holler or wave at me if at any point you can't hear what I'm saying. So, uh, cause I know sometimes that, that happens with the remote folks. So, um, so I think that's a, a great question about um, both capability and versus uh, willingness. Um, so is this a matter of, of capability to supply certain type of security assistance or just the willingness to do so? And then the role of regime type. I think what we found um, interesting is that, um, you know, it's actually not that internal security is completely absent from the United States interactions. Um, so it's not as clean as the United States uh, as either assists only democracies or assists autocracies, but only with external defense. Um, because what we see actually is that the United States, if you look at the, the um, uh, President Biden's, the White House readout of his visit to Hanoi and the joint statement, um, there's actually a, an entire paragraph about elevating law enforcement cooperation, but it is framed very much as rule of law and um, uh, some sort of very specific um, things that do not have to do with political security, the role of the Vietnamese Communist Party. Um, there's nothing about, obviously, about color revolutions. It's um, things uh, so that there is some um, some internal or domestic security or law enforcement cooperation. But even what does exist, what what does exist, is a much smaller fraction of the whole. First and second. Um, it has a, a sort of, it's framed very, very differently. And what's striking when you read through the, the, the readouts is this emphasis on regional security challenges and the language of regional security versus this repeated a sort of hammering of political security on the, the um, bilateral, any bilateral rhetoric on, on the US-Vietnam security cooperation relationship. Um, so I don't think it's, I, I don't, I think regime type is important. And the United States is by law prohibited from providing certain types of assistance, um, police or otherwise, to countries that have been found to engage in, in human rights violations. Um, so it's not quite a regime type argument. It's more a civil liberties and human rights protection um, constraint, um, which is slightly different than like an electoral conception of democracy. Um, so I think there's, there is some regime type story there that's probably worth exploring. But one of the interesting things and one of the reasons why we use the Venn diagram, actually, um, which uh, with that that Isaac um, showed partway through the talk. Yes, thank you. Um, is that it's it's not 100. Per, it's not that these are 100 percent completely different. There is gray area. There is overlap. There is places where both countries are providing um, security cooperation that that has some overlap in, in purpose or kind. Um, it's what we're what we were interested in is the fact that this overlap exists, but there are also these spaces that are fairly dramatically different. Um, and so I don't. Um, I think if it was just regime type at work, we would expect the Venn diagram overlap to be much smaller. Um, but we probably need to do a better job of of articulating theoretically why that is. So that's that's a really helpful comment, and we'll we'll go back and see if we can explicate that logic a little more fully and clearly. Thank you, um, Isaac. Over to you if you have. Want to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's just a thought-provoking question, and that's why we wanted to do this, is that it's a pretty inchoate theory, and I think, you know, this is a pretty, there's a pretty broad way to construe it, and I think you're right that there are different two-by-twos that might capture this variation in some way, and I think it is remarkable that those countries that are most receptive to this regime security, whether, and I think it's independent of whether or not perceive China to be especially good at it or not, it's more like yeah. if you have regime security demand as a state, China has a differentiated security good on offer for you, I think is the way that we're hoping that the logic works. It's kind of a demand-led thing. The supply is, is extant. You could say, you know, the U.S. and China are always open to partnerships that are going to allow them to essentially project their national security vision through that proxy. For the U.S., it really is projecting power in the region. For China, I think it is stabilizing its interests in that region. Um, 
the coincidence of the regime type, I think, is a really important confounding factor. And I think we'd need at a minimum to do like a an alternative explanation that says if this was the driving logic of it, that it's just authoritarian regimes are always going to seek any security assistance and it's not related in any way to to the regional security side of it. I think that's a that's worth exploring. I don't have a great answer for it other than to say uh, this is this is good. This is what this is what we want. We welcome other other critical questions. Please. Oh, um, I, yeah, thank you for the great talk. I also, uh, um, I'm also with Gabriel's uh, point about um, the regime type being a pretty huge factor here. The way I see it is, as you said, US and China provide low supply, these different security goods, just to put it on the table, but those who are more, um, Agreeing with uh, Ch Chinese ways of governing uh, their population would be more willing to kind of be the be on the demand side. So perhaps what you're seeing empirically is that those who are more repressive or more authoritarian would be the one that are more actively seek seeking Chinese ways of uh, Ch Chinese um, fighting um, security good. So my question is. Uh, related to this, I'm just wondering, uh, like, what is, what are the instruments of of this uh, regime good? So the way I see it is, if you kind of intervene into the national security side, I would see is a little bit more sensitive than just like providing the equipment to protect the regional threat. So in terms, I I wonder what what are the layers of in intervention here? Is it just like providing technology? Supplying this like security apparatus, or like getting more data about the, their population, like having more intimate relationships with with officials. So I think those those are like different dimensions of calculations about to what extent those uh, countries are more willing to open their borders for for China to provide regime good. S secondly, I I see that your argument is. These two actors provide complementary uh, goods of providing uh, uh, complementary roles. I just wonder whether um, the Chinese way of providing the, providing these goods would be cheaper in the sense that it would eventually crowd out the U.S. Uh, provision of It'll security. Crowded out. Yeah, crowded out. Yeah. Happy to take a first um, first stab at both of those, Isaac, and then let you follow right. up. Um, uh, so I think that uh, just concretely in terms of what the regime security goods are that China is providing, um, I would bucket that right now into three different categories. One is technology. So um, export of surveillance technology. Um, two is training. The Ministry of Public Security and um, China's police and law enforcement forces do, are increasingly involved in training, um, training, international training and cooperation. Um, and then the, the third thing is in information sharing and intelligence sharing. So um, Chen Yixin made a, the Minister of State Security made a three country trip to Southeast Asia during um, the, the period that we looked at. And Isaac uh, alluded to that, but very specifically talk about creating new information and intelligence um, sharing security mechanisms. Um, and again, the, there's a specific tie to, to political security. Um, so, uh, I would I would say that those are sort of the three main types of goods right now that we're seeing provided on the regime security side. Um, obviously, as we get, you know, one of the things Isaac and I are working on doing now is to try to better define the case universe, right? How many of these supposedly outlier cases are, are out there and how heterogeneous are they? Because we see some variation even between the UAE and Vietnam, because even the type of internal security challenge that they face that China is assisting with is, is somewhat different. And the balance between sort of conventional regional security challenges and internal security threats is also somewhat different. Um, with respect to your second question about, well, is China just a cheaper supplier? And so eventually it will it will crowd out the United States. I think that's possible in some cases. Um, right now, China is relatively new to this sort of internal security cooperation game. 
Um, I really see, I believe it was 2017 as a turning point when Xi Jinping gave a, a sort of big published, you know, state media covered um, address to the political legal system in China and called on China's political legal system to go out and adopt a global vision in their state security work, right? And um, and the Ministry of Public Security and, and China's domestic security actors did that to the point where Wang Xiaohong, the Minister of Public Security, is one of China's most active international diplomats. If you just look at his level of bilateral engagement with foreign counterparts, it's way up there. Um, and uh, I have another project where I have a, a map of that that I would be happy to share if, if you want to follow up um, uh, offline later. Um, so, um, so, you know, really we're talking about this as a last five or six years phenomenon that has been gradually accumulating. Um, but the interesting thing, particularly about Vietnam, is that Vietnam is getting assistance from each of these countries, the United States and China, in part to deal with threats that the great powers each say are caused by the other, right? And so the regional security cooperation um, is very much aimed at maritime sort of, you know, military capacity, maritime domain awareness, which is largely oriented toward the territorial dispute with China in the South China Sea. That's what the United States is assisting with. Conversely, China is assisting Vietnam with political and internal security, and Xi Jinping specifically talked about we're going to cooperate to forestall color revolutions, which China attributes to the United States. Right? And so the communist parties internally are cooperating to confront a common threat that, at least on the Chinese side, is directly attributed to the United States, while the United States and Vietnam are collaborating to deal with an, an external security challenge that the shared perception is that that's being caused by China. Um, and so um, that sort of, um, it's both symmetrical and asymmetrical at the, at the same time. But in situations like that, it's hard to see China completely monopolizing the relationship because it's part of the threat on the regional side, but it's the solution on the internal side. And that's honestly why we found these cases so fascinating because um we're not used to thinking as of somebody as both the sort of problem and the solution in terms of the security environment. And I, I think that we um, it would be helpful if we could figure out how to theorize and wrap our heads around that. That was a longer answer than I intended, but um, but hopefully that was a useful illustration. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add. I think that was really a uh, strong answer. And again, I, I think Sheena's existing work on the nature of these security goods is, gonna, is a big thing that we're leaning on here. And that's one of the reasons I emphasize the personnel. She got into that too. It's just, it's a very nice, neat way of saying like, who are the people that lead the security engagement? What are their offices responsible for? And you see this whole different cast of characters on the Chinese side from what we're used to in the US. And it can be very difficult to see the substance of those interactions, right? We're not seeing the data flows, for example. We know that surveillance using technological <laughs> tools that China has and has been honing in its own domestic practice are a big part of this. That's not something that's publicized directly, but that's what those agencies do. And that's what they provide as a good. And I don't know what the cost proposition is on it. Um, again, I think that the, that transaction level is, is a level of granularity that we haven't gotten to yet. Maybe we do Maybe we do need that, especially if we want this kind of microeconomic analogy of like supply and demand. There should be some price point that clears it. And, you know, one way to get around that, I suppose, again, is this idea of really trying to find the find actual genuine distinctions between the goods that the countries consume. They can they may not be substitutable in some fundamental ways, especially as Sheena points out, when it is, in fact, China's regime security provision that balances out the excess of U.S. regional security provision. It's a little bit of a dialectical conception that maybe is in more, more in keeping with the way that Chinese leadership has talked about national security. And so I think we're kind of following that where it leads. But I do appreciate these questions. I think we do need to ask the, you know, kind of categorical questions about whether this is the right, right way to go. I have a question online, and then I'll go back to the audience real quick. Um, Yin Chengzhe, who was a former fellow of, of the program and now teaches at Syracuse, wants to ask, uh, thanks for the great presentation. I have two questions. 
One, for the Vietnam case, is that also the case that China is providing some form of assurance to Vietnam to address Vietnam's internal security concerns? If this is the case, then could we argue that Vietnam is seeking regional security from both the United States and China? International security, so it's not internal, sorry. Question two, if we apply this regional security versus regime security framework to the case of South Korea, how could we code this case? Is it the case that in which the South Korea uh, relies on the U.S. for both regional and regime security? Thank you. Isaac, you want me to take that or you want uh, to go first this time? I'll, I'll, I'll try going first here. Maybe let me take the second question if you have some thoughts on the first. Um, I think so we, we had some thought about what to say about uh, the sort of U.S. alliance network. It's on this and we actually included Japan and South Korea, NATO. We could add, think of other U.S. treaty allies, and they, you know, this gets to this question about regime type. Why is it that we consider them, at least heuristically here, as not having regime security needs? And I guess that has to do with all of these cases being advanced industrial democracies. And I think that's a that's an analytical thing that we're going to need to going to need to wrestle with. You could posit that the U.S. provides both the regime and regional security goods that they need. Alternatively, it's that there are, you know, thinking about it in demand terms, it's just that there's much less demand for regime security in countries that have stable electoral democracies. And that's just a kind of empirical matter. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that, you know, the regime or the system of governance is in is at risk in most of these countries. And I suppose that'd be an interesting thing. I think we should actually really look hard for this in the spirit of the, the, the selecting on the dependent variable method to find deviant and extreme cases. Are there in fact democracies, and I actually think there are, democracies that have uh, sort of regime security as well as regional security needs. Pakistan is one of the ones we listed in that top left. And I think that might be an interesting case to reflect on a little bit. It's also one with some pretty dramatic changes. The U.S. has historically been the main arms provider for Pakistan intermittently at stages, but was very close partners during the early phases of the global war on terror. China is now de facto its regime and its regional security provider. And that may be that may be an outlier of the outlier cases. That's really the only instance in which I can think of that being true, perhaps North Korea as the other, um, but that's more open-ended. Sheena, did you have any thoughts on the first question or, or a better way of responding to this idea of the, the Japan, Korea, NATO uh, quadrant? Yeah, so I think it, I think, I mean, I think this is um, confirming for me that we probably do need to set some, some scope conditions and theorize how regime type shapes the demand signal. I think that's, that's really a great point that has emerged as kind of a central issue that we've got to address um, more systematically in, in the next iteration of this. So again, just thanks to all of you for highlighting how important that is. Um, and um, in terms of uh, the, let me touch briefly on, on South Korea. So the United States actually did a lot of, of sort of backstopping um, South Korean domestic security um, during the authoritarian period. Mm -hmm. So that's part of a, my part of my first book was about South Korea under military rule and the role that the U.S. alliance played in, in internal security organization and behavior. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, what I know of, of that period there's a marked difference in um, sort of U.S. awareness or or even involvement in, in regime security. Um, even then, the United States actually did have, um, uh, you know, some some limits. It had, but it had operational control over the uh, over the South Korean military even during peacetime, right? And that um, the Korean military had some autonomy. Um, but because it was a military authoritarian government, um, that meant that the United States was certainly more implicated in, in internal security, conduct and decision making, um, and in some ways was, was sort of permissively enabling of, um, of some of the regime security behavior that the, the ROK government pursued, again, in the pre-democratization period. So um, South Korea is actually, I think, in some ways a really um, 
important case, and thank you for highlighting it, because it draws out the importance of the demand signal um, created by, by regime type. So, um, so I don't know if that is a, a helpful um, comment. In places where governance is weak, the United States, I would say it addresses internal or domestic security concerns via rule of law, um, fighting crime, counter narcotics cooperation, right? So some of the cases we've looked more preliminary preliminarily at in Latin America. Um, the United States, again, provides some internal security governance um, assistance, but it is, I would not call it regime security because it is not done with the aim of keeping a particular set of rulers in, or party or leadership in power. And that's the difference to me between regime security and some of the other domestic security, even when we see the United States providing some assistance on internal threats or, or law enforcement cooperation. Um, so I think that that's important to, to note. Um, and then in terms of whether or not the PRC addresses regional security concerns, um, sometimes, right? So there's a regional security element to its cooperation with the, the UAE, um, certainly. Um, and um, it has in some ways, I think, tried to maybe mitigate the the level of threat that Vietnam feels from the territorial dispute um, by sort of offering, like, hey, if you look at the joint statements again, it's very much let's try to let's try to find work to stable to create stability. Let's work to try to find peaceful solutions. Um, you run into whether or not that's been compatible with China's behavior in the region, right? Um, because Vietnam certainly doesn't seem to feel like that's uh, eliminated the threat. Um, but again, I, you know, I, we really tried to stay away from a black or white framing here, um, because China does provide, again, some what I would call regional security in terms of, hey, let's talk about counter smuggling maritime cooperation or counterterrorism maritime cooperation. Um, and again, those elements aren't completely absent from China's assistance. Um, it's, this is much more about sort of where the the bulk and the focus of security cooperation is. And that's why the best way we could come up with to illustrate this is that overlapping Venn diagram to try to get at the idea that there is this gray area, there is this area of overlap, um, but then there are also these areas where the two countries are, are assisting with very different projects. Um, and the, the fact that these exist simultaneously is part of what to us makes this set of cases so intriguing and worth um, trying to describe fully and theorize um, precisely because that, you know, that's kind of hard, or at least initially it was kind of hard for us to wrap our heads around. I hope that's a helpful proto answer. Thank you. Uh, I um, really enjoyed the talk and I think the theory is very intuitive and I think it's, it's right. Uh, but I do think that it may be the fact that these complementary, supplementary polio is allowed by the United States and China by because they they let them be that way. So uh, once these diagrams start sort of like not covering too much and then one either side starts demanding those support conditional on terminating ties with the other side, then these countries do indeed have to choose. Um, so I wonder how these states think about those risks um, about, you know, uh, China being part of the problem, being also the solution. Uh, is it just sort of different actors in Vietnam or UAE pursuing what they think are right in the short term and are not thinking long term risks? Or it's just that they think that US, uh, U.S. and China are not going to really demand those conditional type of threats or make those threats uh, uh, in down the road. Ultimately, then it's really about what Gilbert said. Like it's just that the the world is becoming multilateral. Neither U.S. or China have the power to impose those conditions anymore. Uh, therefore, these states are empowered to do more uh, and with less sort of coercive threats or the bargaining power by uh, great powers. Let me, let me take a first cut at this quickly, Sheena, and, and turn it to you. But I guess the, first of all, it's a really, it's an insightful point. And I think thinking about the structure of the system has to be a part of this too. I think 
some part of it is like there's a permissive international security environment and it's permissive in a particular way. I think it does empower third states. And we do want to tack back to some of the Cold War era discussion of concepts like omnibalancing, for example, or sort of, you know, versions of balance of threat theory that can accommodate this internal axis as well as the external one, which I think are kind of not, that's not a uh, continuum that we tend to think of international security on. Um, the UAE was the one that the, the case that I was thinking about when you're saying that, because th this idea that has to do with the other state allowing that to exist and that there's some threshold at which they might force a choice. The U.S. is trying to force a choice with the UAE. That's why they said no F-35s unless you stop this basing pattern. And what the UAE said is, what basing pattern? And uh, the work has continued on, on it. And in parallel, they've said, you know what? We don't actually want to buy your F-35s. That's where it is now. They left the, the U.S. pulled it and they said, come and talk to us. They came and talked and they said, look, we don't need them that much. And then we went and did an air show in Xinjiang and started talking about buying J-35s. I don't know that that's necessarily a direct substitute so much as a bit of gamesmanship on their part. I think, again, thinking about goods again and maybe belaboring this metaphor, the U.S. makes better goods at the high end of combat military power because that's what their forces are are uh, adept at. There's not a lot of reason, especially given what we know about some of the defense industrial stuff going on in China now, for countries to look at China and say, oh, this is where we want to get our, our hot new tech, unless it's those areas where they're differentiated drones and and sort of the 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 regime security side of that equation um and that doesn't exclude of course surface vessels aircraft submarines they're doing all that stuff but i think it's actually the the insight the uae gives me is that this multipolar system empowers those third states the uae is particularly savvy and is in a particularly important position but i think it's actually maybe not such an unusual circumstance. I think Vietnam is a case of that. And I think many of the other states are quite explicitly trying to, they're recognizing that the great powers have an abiding and concerted and long-term interest in this, and that they're going to be willing to come to the table to talk to them about what kind of security cooperation they can have almost under any circumstances. It's not clear that the U.S. is actually willing to walk away from building its arms relationship with the UAE. I don't think it's a happy circumstance for us to try and play hardball and then to call our bluff on it, which I think is, you know, we could, we could, we could bring Lockheed in here and I'm sure they'd give us another, another spin on it, but on its face, that's basically what's happened here is that the UA says, we don't need you that much. And it's not worth it to us to offend our most important economic partner uh, and someone who understands our security goals in a way that you obviously don't. And I didn't note this, but the UAE has been doing a lot of stuff on its own and keeping with its independent defense base. What they've done starting in 2015 is they don't think that U.S. regional security is necessarily up to the task of dealing with the Houthis. We're watching this right now. They launched their own independent invasion, basically, and seized Aden back from the Houthi rebels in 2015. The Saudis and the Emiratis have engaged in their own entire intensive cam air campaign against them. Uh, on over the objections of the United States. Uh, they've been quite, mostly the Saudis, the UAE seems to have done this somewhat more quietly, but they've engaged in a very, very uh, uh, damaging air campaign and a variety of other campaigns against them. So we do see, there's a longer answer than I intended, but I'm sort of thinking about, it's like under these structural conditions, one of the things that we see is that third countries actually get to d determine some elements of these security dynamics because the security interests of the great powers are such that they're going to be there and they're going to want access. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, Sheena, I didn't want to uh, burn up the, the this question before we go on to the next. Yeah, let me just add one point because I'm broadly in agreement both with what I think the premise of the question was and with your answer that, that yes, in some ways this does um, empower third party actors um, in terms of, of getting the United States and China to... to cough up assistance in um in the name of strategic rivalry or competition or whatever label we're we're putting on it these days. Um 
I guess the one sort of asterisk that I would put there, and this is um, a point that I make in a piece that's coming out um, in parameters in a month or two, um, is that, um, you know, security assistance, if I was a third party, right, I would want to think about how I judge the reliability and the long-term availability continuity of, of different forms of security assistance, because mm -hmm. becoming dependent on China for particular forms of, of assistance um, may come with expectations uh, about continued alignment with China's goals and thinking about regime security. Um, it, not necessarily, right? That's actually the interesting thing about, again, about, about some of these cases in terms of for, the disjuncture between internal and foreign policy, security policy. Um, but it does create an additional um, pathway for potential influence. Um, and so we've seen, to the extent that we've seen China be willing to, um, for example, use its economic leverage to try to achieve certain political goals when push comes to shove, um, and we've seen economic coercion, does this open the door to potential coercion on the security side as well? Um, if I was a third party actor looking at a security cooperation arrangement that made me dependent on China for my ability to stay in power... I would think long and hard about uh, about relying on that kind of external semi patron. Um, again, you know that's speculative, that's hypothetical, that's something I would think about because we don't have a lot of data on China's willingness to use that coerce that leverage coercively. Um, but looking at the economic side, I would at least have to wonder whether that was opening the door to that dynamic on um, my sort of regime security side as well. And um, but again. It's kind of a speculative answer. I just, I think it's worth noting. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, you want to go on yeah. um, I have two quick questions. Um, I'm an ex Longhorn, so um, I wanted to, I actually wanted to meet you in person today, um, but it's great hearing um, both Isaac and Sheena um, present today. Um, on the topic of both um, a previous question and on, I, I guess, this question, I wanted to bring in the aspect of economy. Um, a lot of the countries that you listed are um, under our BRI members. Um, and I wonder how much of that is, I guess, like coalesces or um, is part of this security cooperation because it's not just security, it's economy, it's socialization, right? It's you get tourists, you get um, all of these 400,000 citizens who are coming to work, um, providing jobs, for providing, you know, economics. Um, and then also, how do you see that changing potentially in the future? Because um, this week, um, Chinese stock has fallen to its federal low. Um, and then Part of the future part is sees regime sees internal political security as um, including like five poisons like democracy activists, Uyghur Muslims, Tibetans, um, Taiwanese independence, and the Falun Gong spiritual meditation. While most al U.S. allies do not, so I wonder if there's going to be a point like a breaking point um, in the future where these are malleable and they will change to be more extreme. That was my question. Thank you. Uh, really interesting talk. Thank you. I have a, a question about the like, clarification related to conceptual distinction between regime security needs and regional security. Um, because instinctively, I think of regime security as something that could vary from region from regime to regime, right? Whereas regional security needs would apply, to, you know, vary from region to region rather than from regime to regime. And within a given region like Southeast Asia, I would think all regimes would have similar security needs. Um, if that was the case, regional security needs, yeah. And if that was the case, I'm a little confused why, you know, like if Thailand, Malaysia, Myanmar, those are all in Southeast Asia, why would Myanmar have low regional security needs and Thailand, Malaysia have High regional security needs. Do you have a question too? Oh yeah, I. So a couple of comments. So uh, with Ayumi, I I think the argument is very persuasive as it stands. But since you're looking for 
comments to sort of shake it up. One comment is that this theoretical layout places a priority on the needs, but uh, but everybody's conversation has uh, brought out the fact that what's available, the Venn diagram is the other independent variable because the two providers are not completely um, uh, interchangeable. So uh, it, it's an intersection between the needs and what's offered. And what's offered is a combination of technical possibilities together with political willingness. <clears throat> and if one thinks of it as two sort of independent variables instead, I don't know how you uh, portray that on a on a PowerPoint slide, but somehow if the Venn diagram had an equal theoretical stature with the two by two, it would uh, it would uh, escape a lot of comments, first of all, but it would ar uh, give rise to another question, which is in the intersection area, which I couldn't read because <laughs> of the colors. Yeah, I can't read what's in there. But then the, that would suddenly make make it rather interesting as to why a country picks which which supplier they pick in that middle area, because since both suppliers have that capability, um, so then I I wonder whether I I don't know what's in the null set because you didn't think of some examples going back to the yeah. two by two. There are states that have neither regional nor. Well, uh, but now one could instead ask: Are there states whose security needs are not met by either of the, by the capabilities of either supplier for some reason? And I don't have any ex examples in mind. But I mean, it's small a, island states where climate change is their main threat. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Well, it would take, I guess, more thinking to think about that. Um, the the region the i don't know how you code let's say malaysia and indonesia i don't, I don't know that they're a, i don't wouldn't call them authoritarian so i don't know that the regime type thing quite fits um so then another um thought is um if one changes the question altogether, so this is just an, you know, to ask a different question, which is something like, what explains um, the behavior of states in, uh, if one assumes that you have a bipolar international structure, which I think you're assuming, and I think most of us are happy to accept that assumption, and all kind of middle states and small states have to tilt or balance or hedge. I mean, I guess tilting versus balancing. And then one could ask what explains that behavior. And then that would subsume security co cooperation into a bigger problem, which is not necessarily a good thing. But since you're asking for comments, it seems to me one could, and, and then, and then one could, uh, could uh, look at other forms of balancing. So let's say for South Korea, they may balance or may have endeavored to balance, perhaps without success, between the two major powers by having security cooperation with one and economic cooperation with another. So you would uh, break out of the security uh, focus if you changed the question, mm -hmm. as I say, may not be a good idea, but it's a thought. Well, all these are super thought provoking, and let me let me take the first stab at it, and then I'll I will preemptively apologize that I'll have to rush out at one thirty to catch a train. Um, but I think putting together Andy's last comment with the original question about the sort of economic motivations, I think that's actually part of it, and that's something we need to conceptualize better. Which is that one way of thinking about the Venn diagram is that you know the the stuff that's uniquely chinese security goods is actually kind of borrowed from other domains so the regime security and political security and all the the kind of 
cooperation that's I can share these slides with you so you can see it and, yeah. and uh, I think it's in the in the paper too so uh, but basically you know that's actually kind of a that's a kind of a kitchen sink list in the middle which is China also does some traditional security they also do all this non-traditional security uh, they also do police and law enforcement cooperation and some of that you know we can be agnostic for now as to just how different that is other than to say there are some things that the US just doesn't do and some part of that I think is that the comprehensive national security concept, and I'll defer to China on this, but one of its characteristics is that it's comprehensive and it it is now a composite of a lot of things that used to be considered economic development issues. It is, what is it? Uh, it's the pre prerequisite for development is security. And that's a new configuration for China. I think they used to kind of have equal equal status in some way. And I think that's some part of the proposition that China is offering. I think it's actually quite fundamental to it. When we think about why does China want to provide regime security in a place like the UAE, we're stressing this idea that China has concentrated overseas interests in the UAE. It's in their interest, and they experienced this in the Arab Spring. If you read the way that China talks about, for example, the Libya civil war, what they talk about is the extreme disruption to their investments and their personnel. They had to evacuate 3,600 people from there. They lost $20 billion is the estimate from Chinese sources in, in fixed investments. And what they look at there is the, is the security problem is that these regimes can't keep our overseas interests intact. And I think that explains why you would have a broader scope. I think it, it's part of their Again, comprehensive vision of national security. And I'm, I'm leaving a bunch of interesting things on the table there, but let me hand it over to Sheena in the interest of time. Yeah, I think um, just to, I'll, I'll pick just one of those and I apologize. I'm happy to follow up with anybody who quest, whose questions we didn't get to um, on, uh, offline after this. Um, but I think um, uh, the point about what's interesting is sort of, you know, what happens in the space where the Venn diagram overlaps is a really interesting question because in some ways the the um uh the places where it doesn't overlap are overdetermined. And so then the question is, and I think some of the other questions Stephanie's and others get to, well, are there spillover effects of having a prioritization or a, a relative weighting of one or the other side of the Venn diagram on who gets to sort of corner the market or whether or not anyone does in that that middle space where both countries are plausible suppliers. Um so I think that's uh, something to to follow up and, and think about. And I think a couple of the questions sort of touched on that. Um, I, again, I don't know that I have a, a great answer and would want to go back to some of the case data and evidence um, and, and theorize it a little more cleanly. Um, but I, I take the point and we'll definitely uh, try to pick up on that and see if we can give you a clearer answer in the next version. So um that's only a partial answer, but I know we're we're coming up on time, and I, mm -hmm. I want to be mindful of that. And um, these were great questions. Thank you all so much for for um, the thoughtful engagement and um, very very helpful feedback. Thank you everyone for coming. We're going to end now because we got to make sure we everyone has the time constraints. So uh, thank you again to Isaac and Sheena for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Sheena. Thanks, everyone. Really, exactly. Thank you. Fun.